Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining from different time zones. Thank you for joining us and welcome to session 27 on the role of trade policy in reducing commodity-driven deforestation held as part of the Trade and Sustainability Hub. My name is Soledad Leal and I lead some areas of work on sustainable trade at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, and I will be moderating today's discussion. As a member of the Hub's organizing team, I'd also like to reflect briefly on our discussions so far, given that today is our third and last day of this event. It's been a truly rewarding experience to see how our amazing group of participants have come together to share their ideas, questions, and views on how to ensure that trade policies contribute to sustainable development. Thank you all for creating your creativity, thoughtfulness, commitment, and openness to engage and inspire. It is in this context that we have designed today's panel, which addresses a topic that is right at the intersection of governance frameworks for trade and sustainability. These frameworks include the World Trade Organization, WTO rules, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, and the commitments that parties have made under multilateral environmental agreements known as MEAs, such as the Paris Agreement and the Convention on Biological Diversity, or CBD. That topic, is our forests and how we can better protect them. We have seen under the Paris Agreement how forests are recognized as critical for achieving climate change objectives. Since forest conservation supports carbon storage in tree cover. When it comes to the CBD, forests are recognized as biologically diverse systems that offer a variety of habitats for plants, animals, and microorganisms. They represent some of the richest biological areas on Earth. As a result, forests are at the heart of the CBD post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, which is currently under negotiation with the goal of being adopted next year. When it comes to the SDGs, both SDG 12 on responsible consumption and production and SDG 15 on life on land call on countries to, I quote, protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. End of quote. However, these overarching sustainable development objectives are often hindered by agriculture and livestock expansion, which are the most important direct drivers of deforestation and forest degradation. There is a growing level of awareness among actors involved in international trade, from policymakers to end consumers, of the urgent need to protect our forests. Public and private sector actors alike have now designed and implemented various trade-related measures and instruments to reduce deforestation linked to forest commodities such as cocoa, palm oil, soybean, and timber. Some governments in consumer countries are exploring new policy options to address deforestation and forest degradation, especially in producer countries. These options include unilateral trade-related measures, forestry-specific environmental provisions contained in regional trade agreements, voluntary sustainability standards known as VSS, and mandatory due diligence requirements from consumer countries. Earlier this year, IISD organized a webinar that touched on many of these topics and questions. Following that event, we published an issue paper in which we looked more closely at some of the ideas raised on trade policy, sustainability standards, and deforestation. Our main focus was the different policy options chosen by parties to a free trade agreement to address environmental objectives. What we found was that the range of options was significant, from no reference to environment or just broad references in the trade agreements preamble, to the inclusion of specific chapters on trade and sustainable development. We also noted a recent development in the Comprehensive Economic and Partnership Agreement, SIPA, between Indonesia and the EFTA countries, Iceland, Liechtenstein, Norway, and Switzerland, where the parties included a provision for preferential trade, uh, tariff treatment for a product, in this instance, palm oil, and its derivatives contingent upon compliance with private sustainability standards linked to forest conservation. In our analysis, we also mentioned that the differentiated tariff treatment based on how goods are produced and processed, known as process and production methods, or PPMs, is a long-standing issue in the WTO context, where there are questions over whether this treatment is consistent with the WTO principle of non-discrimination. 
Against all this background, in today's session, we will take a closer look at the PPM concept to better understand its meaning and typology, and how these questions could be dealt with in the WTO context, and how PPMs could enable more sustainable supply chains. We will also mention some more recent policy developments to help further set the scene and show where we might be headed next. Among these developments are the publication of legislative proposals in some countries and country groups on due diligence requirements aimed at tackling deforestation. There's also the notable outcome from COP26 in Glasgow last month, where more than 100 countries encompassing some 85% of the world's forests vowed to end deforestation by 2030. We will discuss the potential implications of new measures for farmers and producers in developing countries. We will also examine how some of these measures would interact with multilateral trade rules, along with whether and how these measures could be implemented without running contrary to the WTO principle of non-discrimination. Lastly, we will look at how WTO members can contribute to anchoring more sustainability considerations into the multilateral trading system. We have an excellent panel composed of specialists from a range of fields who will help us broaden our policy perspective. They will explore how the different regimes can interact and how regulation in consumer countries can contribute to reducing deforestation in a non-discriminatory manner from a trade perspective while ensuring sustainable livelihoods. We will first have a set of presentations from our panel followed by a brief Q&A. Our discussions will then provide further context and analysis after which we'll open the floor for a more detailed Q&A segment. I'm delighted to now announce our speakers and discussants. Our speakers are Dr. Elizabeth Burke Bonanomi, who is Senior Researcher, Co-Head Sustainability Governance at the Center for Development and Environment of the University of Bern, Switzerland. Ms. Beth Child, who is Deputy Director for International Climate Change Campaigns and Co. in the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy of the United Kingdom. Dr. Enrico Partiti, who is Group Legal Counsel for Sustainable Finance at Triodos Bank. Mr. Chris Vico, who is director in the Timber Validation Department at Ghana's Forestry Commission. Our discussants are Mr. Obed Odusu Adai, who is a managing campaigner at EcoCare in Ghana, Dr. Daniel Lauchenauer, who is a program manager at the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, SECO, in Switzerland, Ms. Santa Ruxtul, who is a public affairs senior manager at Nestlé, Swiss. We invite you all to pose your questions in the chat box throughout the event. My colleague, Andreas Oeschke, and I will gather them and direct them to our panelists. So without further ado, I'm pleased to give the floor to our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Burgi Bonanomi, who will set the scene with an example of new approaches implemented in preferential trade agreements. She will share perspective on sustainable trade and PPMs. And in the second round of questions, she will elaborate on the WTO law and panel decisions. Dr. Burgi Bonanomi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Soledad, for this very kind introduction. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here in this panel. I'd like briefly to share my screen. Um, hope this works. Do you see my slides? Is that OK? Uh, so um, my presentation today will focus on buy and plurilateral and domestic measures consumers countries are increasingly taking to disable commodity driven deforestation elsewhere not at home but elsewhere and instead enable sustainable production processes that promote sustainable landscapes I will take a perspective from a sustainability science. Uh, I will take a sustainability science perspective. I'm being a, I, I have a legal background, but I'm based at CTE, uh, University of Bern, where we take a strong inter and transdisciplinary uh, perspective. So this is, um, my presentation will be informed by this. My presentation will also be informed by a research project funded by the Swiss National Fund. Uh, I'm heading, on the question on how to use trade relations to promote diversified food systems. At the moment, almost every day, you see, at least in our consumer countries, 
ideas that are discussed to incentivize or how you could incentivize sustainable way of productions elsewhere in other producer countries and disincentivize unsustainable ways of production. Uh, we talk about product-based regulations and non-product-based regulations. If it's about non-product-based regulations, the whole due diligence agenda that centers around uh, obligations for business enterprises. These are basically non-product related, related regulation, and uh, but you also have measures that are very product specific, uh, like product differentiation. I will can give an example afterwards. You also have a combination of these kind of regulations, as for example, in the draft of the e the very new draft of the EU non deforestation regulation, which we will hear more about uh, by a. Uh, and other present. Um, to reiterate, I said there are different ways of approaching this question. How can we as consumer countries have an impact on deforestation elsewhere? And so you have these products related and, and unproducts related kind of regulation which are currently discussed. And in Switzerland, particularly much discussed is are these product related uh, regulations which uh, are basically PPMs. And this also relates to the discussion we had here and the referendum. We have a new provision in the constitution saying that the government should create conditions for trade relations that contribute to the sustainable development of the agriculture and food sector. So currently we have a discussion how this should be kind of implemented in tra into trade agreements in order to make sure that this obligation is complied with. So lawyers see in this uh, provision of the constitution obligation to differentiate along the lines of sustainability and to frame trade measures in an inclusive, non-discriminatory way and also to comply with international obligations. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a concrete example uh, in the IFTA Indonesian agreement where this approach has been applied for a first time. Uh, in EFTA countries, or at least uh, in a trade agreement of EFTA countries. So this new EFTA Indonesian agreement includes a provision saying that preferential tariffs given to palm oil imports are conditional upon the way they have been produced. So a footnote in, a, in the main chapter of the agreement relates to the sustainability chapter saying, okay, this palm oil that gets this preferential tariff, so kind of a lower tariff within a quota, must uh, be introduced in the way as, as put down here in 8.10. So which is quite a comprehensive framework of sustainability. Next one. Uh, this preferential conditionality, let us say, is coupled with the chapter on cooperation and technology transfer. So in the agreement, the IFTA countries promise Indonesia, okay, if we do that kind of conditionality, we give you financial and technical assistance, which still needs to be, um, there is some assistance out there and it's it's the kind of the, the, the the agreement has just been uh, ratified, so it's quite a new process. In Switzerland, we have an ordinance to um, implement this uh, provision. So there was a lot of discussion around this provision since we had a public referendum on that. So all, the whole public was interested in that. And now we have an implementation procedure where the government decided not to again say in the regulation what is exactly sustainability, but only refers to agreements. And um, the government argues if the palm oil production complies with certain standards which are out there, they are deemed to be also thought to be sustainable. There is a process behind to make sure that it's really sustainable, but they directly refer in the agreement to a voluntary standards that are out there. Next one. Um, so there is a discussion now uh, whether this implementation process will be effective since uh, from a sustainability research perspective, you would rather argue um, it's a bit simple to just refer to uh, certification standards since they often do not reflect, uh, really reflect what happening, what's happening on the ground. And that transformation, particularly in, in very, uh, um, 
complicated sectors as the palm oil sector, transformation requires lots of time and resources and you rather need to take a landscape approach and you have to promote these kind of transformation and, and uh, it's uh, until now it's unclear whether this uh, this new approach of, of, of linking conditionalities to better market access etc will play out there will be a, an ex post evaluation at the latest stage it's also discussed a bit that this palm oil preferential tariff uh, quota only applies to certain palm oil imports, but other imports are not uh, covered by this provision. Next one, please. Next one, Andrea. Um, since we will have also, we have also this EFTA Mercosur negotiations in parallel to the EU, uh, the EU Mercosur negotiations, and there's a discussion right now here whether this PPM approach selected in the SIPA is also should also be applied in the Mercosur agreement as regards, uh, for example, gold, meat, and soy. So far, the text is not public, and we do not know whether this has been integrated into the Mercosur agreement. Next one. Um, so what has been done here by the EFTA Indonesian uh, and the Indonesian government is to introduce a PPM into a bilateral a plurilateral trade agreement. And as my, most of you know, a PPM is a kind relates to process and production methods. And it, it's in trade slang, you call it a PPM when a trade measure does a product differentiation based on the production behind. So you don't see that in the product, how a product has been produced, but you refer to the production processes behind a product. So you differentiate between seemingly like products and the state what is different in if you compare to actual practice is that the state makes the, the distinction not, not the private business act. So the state comes in, the public actor com comes in and tries to ensure quality of certain private labeling schemes that are out there. So next one. Um, there is a, a renewed interest in PPMs. So PPMs have been discussed quite a lot in the 90s, but then it disappeared, uh, discussion disappeared again. And now there's a renewed interest in PPMs. You see that, for example, if you go through the EU Green Deal uh, and the test forum, you have uh, in the test declaration, this draft declaration, you have um, implicitly mentioned uh, such approaches. For example, the Dutch parliament has just issued an analysis of PPMs and to which extent are they allowed by WTO jurisprudence, etc. Next one. Uh, there's a saying that there are plenty of PPMs out there, but no one talks about them. You have, if you look closer at existing regulation, you find plenty of them in, um, in legal practice. You see a differentiation along different lines. So for example, in the deforestation or in the current FLECT framework, you have a, a or the FISH framework, you have a distinction between legal and illegal um, fish or timber that's uh, really, um, with a reference to trade measures, but you can also have a distinction between sustainable and unsustainable uh, ways of production or other specific conditions. Next one. Uh, and you have different kind of trade measures linked to PPMs, like trade restrictions, where you say this, this product must not enter our market, where you have a preferential treatment as now in the SIPA as presented, where you say, okay, you have lower tariffs on this good that has been produced in a sustainable way. Or you also see, for example, labeling requirements um, by the government. Next one. Uh, there are examples of PPMs, as I said, you find in the timber framework, in the fish framework, in the biofuels framework, the public procurement framework. Next one. Uh, you have 
old examples also, for example, in the Montreal Protocol on the ozone layer, where trade is restricted of products that have been produced with certain substances. You find PPMs also in the subsidy frameworks, like for example, in organic farming, where specific subsidies are targeted to, uh, to farmers that produced in an organic way, or you find them also in migration agreements, like where, for example, you give trade preferences for products resulting from refugee employment. So you have kind of a PPM uh, picture out there. It's quite fragmented and not lots of literature. There's not a lot of literature on it so far and effectivity is, uh, is questioned to a certain extent. Next one. Um, if you look, um, for example, at least here in Switzerland, if you had uh, this, this debate some years ago, whether PPMs, whether the government should go in this direction and whether this is allowed by uh, the WTO framework and WTO jurisprudence. But today it's quite, quite clear that there is some flexibility in the WTO legal framework, but it very much depends on how PPMs are shaped. Um, the use of PPMs is partly restricted, but there is some flexibility. You have open textured rules and jurisprudence is not so clear, it's quite contradictory. You have to assess a PPM from a case to case basis. And um, yeah, while you ha still have some uncertainties as regards outcome. You are, if you frame a PPM and, and would like to do it in a WTO compliant way, you are on a safer side if you frame it very carefully. If you do kind of establish a framework that is consistent towards insight. So this means you should not ask uh, to your trading partner to comply with certain conditions if you do not comply with these conditions domestically. And in, if you, by doing so, so incentivize sustainable trade instead of hindering. So if you kind of go down with tariffs or, or incentivize trade flows, then it's um, much easier to do so. And if you do them in a, in a FTA, in a trade agreement where all partner countries have agreed to do so, it's more, then these are less under scrutiny and it's rather an experimental field where you can try out these kind of approaches. It's much easier than to do it in a domestic way where uh, kind of opposition will be stronger. Next slide. Uh, in our research project, we ask ourselves the question, if we did this product differentiation approach in a way, not only that is compliant with WTO jurisprudence, but that it makes sense from a sustainability on the ground perspective. So we have, for example, uh, case studies in Bolivia on Laos and asking the, uh, the farmers there of how, if we go in this direction, how that should be framed so that they benefit from this approach. We come to the conclusion that a government should not never regulate many details. It should limit, limit itself to define core criteria of sustainability. And if possible, relate to certain kind of international common understanding, which is out there. For example, there's more and more common understanding of what sustainable agriculture production is even if we don't have the legal framework to define that, but there is quite an understanding out there. We have also studies on that. And you should base on scientific evidence uh, what you're doing. Um, the pricing is important. You cannot just ask uh, your trading partner to do, uh, for example, farming in a different way if you do not pay the, uh, the price that is needed for that. And you have to strike a balance between complexity and simplicity. Next one. Uh, we would rather um, consult the government if it would go in this direction, not to kind of take vulnerable uh, kind of voluntary standards that are outer certification standards on the, uh, done by private actors and, and just include them into the regulation, but rather have these core criteria in regulation and, and establish an accreditation procedure where 
the government can accredit all kinds of certifications which are out there, which are also inclusive bottom-up certification, which can be easily accessed by more vulnerable producers, for example. So that you have a full range of certification that can be acknowledged to comply with these core criteria of sustainability uh, if you go in this direction. You should uh, think of a framework that positively discriminates on behalf of sustainable food systems and eventually also a framework that negatively discriminates again a food, against a food system that is really detrimental. Yeah, next one. And what uh, I think is very important also has been raised by another panelist on Wednesday from Brazil, Ana Maria Toni, is a principle of non-discrimination. It's also enshrined in WTO. That would mean uh, if you think through if a government would go for a product differentiation in domestic or bilateral treaties or domestic regulation, it must combine the conditionality with alternative market access. You should not just um, build in conditionalities and say, we do not want this kind of product, but rather also enable other products to enter the market in order to help uh, the farmers and producers um, to get other markets to um, uh, and to, to have a good livelihood. So it's not just hindering, but it should enable, uh, for example, you can work on equivalence of standards when it's uh, about forest and uh, non-timber forest products and help to enter and build new markets in order to have alternatives um, for those producers that are um, affected by this regulation. Next one. So with this PPM approach, which is currently a lot discussed in Switzerland, maybe less discussed in other countries, um, they have lots of potential. They are much more, if you look at the trade agreements, they're more concrete and targeted than sustainability chapters. So you can say, okay, we enable trade flows of this product, but under these conditions, they have the potential to enable sustainable production processes and hinder unsustainable production processes if linked with cooperation and financial assistance. And um, they also have the potential to address limits of private governance. You, there's this label mess out there. And if the government comes in and says, okay, labels are good ones if they comply with this and this and this, then you can have a certain kind of uh, quality assurance of what is out there. And the next one, there is of course also a risk with this approach. Uh, you infringe on government systems of others. So this is a discussion uh, we're quite familiar with, I think most of us, and you tend to exclude vulnerable producers just if it's done in a good way, in non-discriminatory way, you should not do that. You should rather do the other way around. You should, you should rather include them into the value chains you'd like to support. And it might be misused easily as a protectionist tool, as you see that now with the government procurement frameworks, which are, uh, which are coming up. And uh, it's also risky to be too complex. So with this uh, next one. I'd like to thank you and hand over again to Solidat. Thank you. Thanks so much, Elizabeth, for this very comprehensive presentation that sets the scene and, and explains in a very detailed way uh, the issues at stake. Thanks very much. With that, I'm pleased to give the floor to Ms. Beth Child, who will take a talk about the core elements of the forest, agriculture, and commodity trade fact dialogue, in particular its trade-related elements, and we'll share an update on the main policy outcomes of COP26 in relation to fact dialogue and the next steps in the process. Ms. Child, you have the floor. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting me into this, this space as well. I mean, in the fact dialogue, um, trade is absolutely at the heart of what we're doing, but I have to confess, until now, most of our conversations have been in the climate space. So. I'm so pleased to be here and to be making those connections and to be learning as well from Elizabeth's great introduction. I am going to do a really quick run through about the FACT dialogue, where it came from, um, and but also delve into some of those areas of most interest, I hope, to you on the kind of trade, trade and market side. 
Um, and then maybe look at how we, some ideas, throw some ideas out there for how we can kind of link up greater with the kind of trade conversations and the, the WTO. But my hands are up. We are we are still infants in this space. We're, we're only just a year old and, and, and kind of I'm really keen to hear the views of others um, in this kind of in this uh, meeting today and, and t tell us how you think those links can be strengthened. So I, I can put ideas out there, but your ideas, you're probably much more well versed in this than I am. But by way of background, kind of going back to the, the, the kind of the early days of the UK's COP26 presidency, we obviously had um, a lot of kind of priorities around the ambition raising, uh, the NDCs, but also, of course, on the kind of negotiation elements. But in addition to that, our prime minister was really, really clear. There were kind of four areas of sectoral action we had to take. and We had to take it rapidly in order to reduce emissions by half by 2030. And those were the areas of cash, cars, coal and trees. So from that position, a real focus around trees for our presidency, we kind of we, we thought about where we can most where we can most add value. And I think it's very clear to us that as I mean, it's well known in the climate space. I'm sure with, with speakers here and, and participants today, land use is responsible for 25 percent of our kind of global emissions. And yet kind of uh, yet also 30 percent of the mitigation potential also comes from this area. And within that space, you, you delve under the surface, of course, agricultural expansion and our absolutely relentless demand for globally traded agricultural products is driving more than 80% of tropical deforestation. And we know 100, 100%, of, I think 100 times the amount of money is flowing into unsustainable than it is to sustainable, even though that kind of long term economic prize of, of going sustainable and sustainable trade is something like 4.5 trillion. Um, so it, 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 it's massive, but at the, the, the moment the flows are going in the, in the wrong direction in spite of the potential. But actually, like drawing on what Elizabeth says, we also know we can't just turn off the taps. We can't, we can't just kind of ban stuff and create barriers. This is all about actually improving market access, recognising at, the, at the, the, the heart of this production of commodities, our, our farmers, our, our, our communities, our jobs, our livelihoods, is economic development at the country level. So we knew from the very beginning that absolutely our work in the space would have to be hand in hand with the kind of supporting, enabling transition and creating kind of growing sustainable trade, not putting up barriers. And we also knew that if we're going to do this properly, we need to do it. it has, it's a dialogue. It has to, at its heart, be a dialogue between all countries, wherever they are in the producer or consumer spectrum. And I guess we looked around in this space and we couldn't find a place that existed for us to have that conversation in a kind of really uh, collaborative, inclusive way um, with the kind of key countries across that spectrum. And so therefore we created the fact dialogue to try and enable that conversation to happen. So, as I said, we're about a year old, we're still quite little, um, but we did, we created it with Indonesia, really important, again, our co-chairs in Indonesia, we created it back in 2020, and we kind of, and we got 28 countries around the table from across the spectrum, representing kind of 75% of global trade in these, in these key commodities, we got them around the table, we came together back in April last year, we agreed a, uh, some kind of print, high level principles, a kind of, uh, a vision for what for what was important and we also kind of uh, pulled out some key areas four areas we really wanted to work on together and those as you can see from the slide are trade and markets transparency and traceability smallholders and then research development and innovation and so we set with working with a great bunch of co-chairs in each of those areas including Ghana who are here, are here today we went about and tried to kind of think about where would be the priorities for actions in each of those areas and that really accumulated then in Nature Day at COP, which is kind of the first Saturday, we, um, we published a, a roadmap for action, which had kind of two parts, all 28, and then the picture, the picture, there we go, all, all 28 countries coming together and publishing this roadmap, which included a joint statement from all countries, but then also a kind of chair statement that outlined 14 specific actions under, under into those, those areas, those four areas on the slide. And a really, really big momentous occasion and an absolutely kind of as well as the action symbolised actually how powerful and how effective collaboration can be when countries can come together and agree how they want to work together towards a common aim of obviously reducing deforestation, but also absolutely supporting sustainable trade.
I'm going to just really consciously, because of the audience here, I want to make sure that I kind of really clearly set out what those four actions we agreed were on the trade and market. So I'm going to read them quite carefully. But of course, do go to the Fact Dialogue website that's on the slide if you want to look at the, the roadmap and read it yourself in your own time. So the four actions on the trade and markets that we agreed were to firstly explore options for how supply and demand side market and trade policies can be more complementary and more mutually reinforcing. The second one, which is in some ways what we're doing today or starting to do today, is to kind of map how the fact dialogue can better support other international processes and fora that address the issues of sustainability in regard to trade and markets. So absolutely this group of people we're talking to today, but we need to do that more and more systematically. Um, and the third action was to build understanding of common factors necessary for sustainable production in a way that helps establish common expectations among producer and consumer countries. And finally, the fourth action in this space was to explore, a really important one, explore ways to strengthen and broaden international market recognition of national approaches to providing assurance of sustainability. So for example, build common understanding of consumer interest into sustainable practices and kind of facilitate market access that way. So we pulled those actions together. They were, I, I, I recommend you look at the ones on transparency and traceability as well, because actually they are very, very kind of obviously closely linked and kind of the enablers in many, many respects for the trade and markets one. So do go there. But, but we produce we, we produce this. Um, we've got a fantastic array of companies, but also kind of the multi stakeholder side as well and corporates as well as um, um, uh, community groups as well, all, all behind this. Um, but we've got a lot of work to do. It's, it's, we, we, we've kind of set out what we want to do, but then actually we have to really roll our sleeves up now and 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 to make the and, and to drive this stuff forward. So I think over the next kind of year or so, when I look when I look at it, I haven't got the answers yet. But there are probably three areas I think we really need to work on. One, we need to shore up the dialogue. We are still a young institution and we have lots of kind of goodwill there, but I think we have to do, we have to do more to kind of make sure it's delivering for all participants and keep the momentum going so that the kind of the goodwill which is there kind of moves forward into this following year um, and up certainly up into kind of COP27 and beyond. Um, I think we're looking to have a kind of kickoff meeting with senior officials in, in January. We, we hope obviously to be able to build out to kind of that, that rhythm of kind of meetings and, and, and ministerial meetings as well. We really, really need to secondly get into the kind of the nitty gritty now of those actions of of the, of the and with those particular countries who are at, who are most interested in those actions. I think a bit like the WTA, you don't always expect every country to want to work on every single area, but actually with a small group of countries really working in depth in some of those kind of in each action is really important. So we're we're looking to to to, to work with the dialogues and our co-chairs to really stand up. Um, uh, rigorous and uh, vigorous action in each of those areas and I guess the third thing we need to do and again goes back to the kind of the conversation here we need to look up and look out we, we've been focused around COP and getting to COP but absolutely we need to connect up with better with these trade conversations that are happening here with the WTO and elsewhere so I think really keen to do more of that and therefore what are the opportunities for kind of for greater collaboration particularly in the WTO space now I am not going to pretend I have the perfect answer here. I feel I feel I feel I feel very kind of junior compared to to, to, to you that you you who are much more kind of expert in this space. Um, but I do I, mean, I do personally feel really heartened by the work that's been happening in the WTA forum, um, and I think it's and, and that kind of that that mutual complementarity between this idea of being kind of obviously supporting sustainability and supporting sustainable trade. So I think I think there's a lot of kind of there's a lot of groundswell of uh, collaboration we, we can do. I'd love to see how in the tested informal group, how we can kind of pull to have more detailed discussions about the ideas that we're coming up with in test those with a the group there, keen though to make sure that the kind of producer countries would be well represented. I'm really keen that we can keep socialising the fact dialogue within the Committee on Trade and Environment. We've given updates there before. I think there's more we can do again to socialise our and to test our emerging thinking. Um, and I'm really interested in exploring the work that the Director General is doing more and more with the private sector, with small and medium enterprise as well, to see how we can kind of bring in some of our agenda and, 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 and utilise those dialogues um, to again have those deeper, further conversations. So in conclusion, 
I think I'm delighted we're making these connections. There's obviously a huge amount of work going on in different fora that is hugely complementary. Um, but I, I welcome the thoughts of everyone here today about how we can take this forward in a collaborative way going, going on in 20, into 2022. Many thanks. Many thanks to you, Ms. Child. Thanks for this uh, very comprehensive presentation in which you shared the four actions agreed upon by participants in the fact dialogue, and also uh, your views on, on the work that can be done at the WTO. Thanks very much. Uh, now I'm pleased to hand over to Dr. Enrico Partiti, who will share his perspective on the role of voluntary sustainability standards in due diligence requirements and how they relate to deforestation. Dr. Partiti, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much, Soledad. Many thanks for the kind invite. Uh, yeah, I, I think that what we are seeing in the EU as a recent regulatory development with the introduction of this proposal for a deforestation regulation is indeed very, very crucial for, uh, uh, for the disciplining trade in products connected to deforestation. And in this measure also, I think voluntary sustainability standards could play a role. But just let me introduce briefly this type of regulatory uh, approach that the measure chooses, which I think is quite, uh, quite key and also relatively novel in the sense that really incorporates elements of private action. So really relying on companies on undertaking, but also on private standards uh, in the context of what is a, a trade measure ultimately. So a measure that regulates uh, the placing on the market of, uh, of certain products. Uh, so really it's important to see uh, is similar to the EUTR, the EU timber regulation, uh, a similar measure that also is present in the US, in uh, South uh, uh, Korea and Australia. It is companies, it is uh, the due diligence systems, the due diligence management system of companies that is leveraged by the regulator to ensure that uh, transformation occurs within the supply chain and eventually only certain products are traded in the, in the EU market. So this is not really an extraterritorial measure, but it's interesting to see that the regulatory work is done in combination, uh, a combination between public and private actors and companies, um, including uh, the supply chain, their supply chain outside the uh, EU. And this proposal is actually following a rather uh, detailed uh, um, request by the European Parliament to legislate on this aspect, also fleshing out uh, very precise criteria in the regulation. The Commission picked on some of them, not, not on all of the suggestions made by the Parliament, but one of the main obligations uh, still remains and is that the placing on the EU market of certain agricultural commodities, such as cattle, soy, uh, cocoa, coffee, timber, and palm oil, is permitted only when these commodities uh, are, have not resulted in deforestation, basically. They're deforestation free, uh, that also includes uh, forest degradation, as uh, so also degradation free. Um, and, and this has to be uh, demonstrated by the undertakings that place it on the market. And there is also an obligation that applies also to the export of these commodities. So the regulation, in fact, applies equally to uh, domestic product and foreign products. So it's not prima facie discriminatory on this aspect. Um, and it, it's limited to forest in the sense that um, undertaking companies that place these commodities will have to demonstrate that they do not originate from areas that used to be a forest at a given cutoff date, which is the end of 2020. And here there's a bit of a difference with the proposal of the parliament, because the parliament also wanted to include other ecosystems and also require companies to demonstrate that their commodities did not damage or did not result in the destruction of, of other important natural ecosystems. Uh, but the main obligation here really applies to the companies and is the companies that have to demonstrate, uh, first of all, they have to apply due diligence, so they have to implement some risk management. Uh, process that consists basically of three phases is having access to information, assess the risk, in this case, the risk of deforestation, and mitigate those risks. Uh, so, companies really have to set up certain systems, uh, uh, basically, supply management systems that allow them to have information about the area or the commodities, uh, where these commodities and where these products originated from. On the basis of the information, and they have to perform a risk assessment. So to what extent um, are these areas at risk of uh, deforestation? And on the basis of the risk assessment, if the risk is high or if the risk is medium, companies could take, may have to take certain measures, including mitigating those risks, uh, for example, by using certification, which is one of the possible mechanisms. But 
ultimately, if companies cannot mitigate the risk, they have to refrain from selling uh, commodities in the uh, in the EU market, from placing it on the EU market. So basically, companies will have this sort of you can sort of gatekeeper on on whether certain uh, unwanted, undesired, uh, dangerous commodities are for, for forests are marketed in the EU. And the measure also has a very strong enforcement, um, a set of enforcement mechanisms, uh, designated authorities in which member states will have to perform checks on, on operators, very high fines, also very interesting complaint mechanism uh, where uh, companies, but also individuals, NGOs can file complaints uh, whenever there is suspect that certain uh, unwanted commodities are marketed in the EU. Um, and also the Commission will have to implement a sort of a risk, country risk uh, map uh, that will support companies in, uh, in complying with their obligation. Basically, countries will be placed in a low risk, uh, standard risk and high risk category. Uh, and this should support company in, in understanding what measures have to be taken. And there is also a very important obligation, I would say, uh, concerning engagement with trading partners, uh, support to producers, and generally supporting, helping trading partners in complying with these measures and also in ensuring that you know, deforestation takes place, so also strengthening the action uh, taken to uh, in the context of various programs such as RDD Plus, et cetera. Um, but it's important to see how these measures actually have a close connection with voluntary sustainability standards uh, and certification uh, because it naturally sort of interacts with them, it naturally affects them. So even Elizabeth was taking, we're talking about the limits of private governance. I think that this type of regulatory interventions are also capable of uh, scaling up in a way, in a way, uh, voluntary sustainability standard and certification. Um, Standards are not explicitly recognized in the uh, in the measure as it happened under other EU measures like the Renewable Energy Directive, where producers could just use certain uh, recognized uh, uh, recognized by the Commission such as certification that have been recognized to comply with their sustainability requirement. But here, standards implicitly uh, sort of play a role because um, companies could use them. Uh, of course, the liability, the responsibility to comply with this measure lies on the undertaking, but companies could use them uh, to have access to information about origin, uh, so it becomes really important here the chain of custody requirement, the chain of custody um, uh, rules in the standard systems, identifying origin and ensuring that these commodities are not mixed uh, with other commodities. Um, and could also use as, as not so clear from the text, but probably also as a risk mitigation. So if you are certified, if you certified your production in an area that is a high risk of deforestation, uh, you could sort of lower the risk uh, of, of deforestation uh, when you use certifications. Uh, so, but why do I say that there is a close connection and also possibly a considerable impact uh, from this measure on the standards? Is that because standards really have to step up their game basically if they want to be used by by companies companies are liable and companies will not use standards if they cannot have them properly in complying with these measures so i think that this is really sort of a call for standards to step up their uh what's the certification monitoring mechanisms ensuring that indeed audit is performed properly and also complement audit with other type of requirements uh, step up their chain of custody requirements ensuring that traceability is ensured uh, throughout the uh, throughout the supply chain, including including segregation, and I think that standards remain very important. Also, um, in another them and providing another uh, aspect that is, I think it got a bit missed in in the proposal of the Commission, because the Commission decided to uh, sort of separate a bit this obligation from uh, social and environmental due diligence, human rights due diligence, which was a bit the approach followed by the parliament. It is very much focused also on engagement within the supply chain and also sharing of cost. And this is a bit lost with this approach. And this is where standards uh, as platform that take into account and include different interests uh, and also have, you know, contribute to landscape initiatives, etc. It could be this forum where uh, different interests are taken into account and even a sharing of cost and compliance between entities in the supply chain, as a very important aspect also mentioned by Elizabeth, is, um, is taken care of. Uh, so indeed, standards could also complement this, this aspect that uh, indeed also is mentioned in the, in the regulation, uh, as the Commission also requires uh, member states and to, to contribute to, to, to engage, continue to engage and engage even more with producing countries. So this is a bit the, uh, uh, from my uh, a brief overview of the measure and its connection with private standards. So I uh, look very much to your question and thank you for your uh, attention. 
Many thanks, Dr. Pakiti, for uh, giving an, uh, an update on, on, on this uh, proposal and also sharing your, your views on, on how uh, BSS standards uh, relate uh, to due diligence requirements and to the deforestation. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Ms. Chris, uh, Mr. Chris Biko, who will bring in the perspective from a producer country. He will share views on how policies may impact or have impacted his country and on the challenges and the opportunities such policies represent for the fulfillment of this country's sustainable development objectives. Mr. Biko, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Soledad, and um, good afternoon to all the, the others on, online. And uh, very refreshing, uh, insightful presentations, I must say. So um, I, I'm, I'm following up, as you, as you rightly said, with the the, the, the impacts and how we see it from this uh, the supply the supply end. Um, so I, I'm going directly to speak to um, the, the the influence of the markets, the Western markets, European markets, um, on on how we do things here. So power and policy influence of European markets is certainly without question. Um, policy instruments that reflect for instance, has, has shaped the forest sector governance and trade landscape over the last decade, Ghana in particular. For instance, in response to destination market requirements, uh, we have had to integrate legality, timber legality into timber resource management legislation. So this wasn't the case some 10 years ago. But today, when you pick legislation on forest management, uh, you would certainly see as an integral part uh, timber legality requirements. And this standard must be met if you want to actually trade in timber, even in country. And uh, secondly, I've been talking about the impact of, of, of uh, external policy, market policy, uh, trade policy on, 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 on the local environment. Um, legality is therefore mandatory at the national level. Uh, as, as we may recall, I mean, pre previously, those who wanted to show some proof of uh, certified products uh, went by voluntary means, but currently, especially in Ghana, who responded to the policies, uh, or fl the flag policy, um, it's, it's now mandatory to show legality of timber across the board. It's not only for timber going outside the country, but timber that is sold. And so increasingly, there is less and less discrimination between the exports and the domestic supply chain. Again, an impact of what external policy has done. Um, and not the least, uh, stakeholder participation in the policy process uh, that ensures the tenets of good governance are upheld has suddenly get gain traction. Um, and I must add that with the introduction of legality audits in our forest management regulation, um, there is increased transparency in the application of forest management standards. So the, the, this is just an example, picking one sector of what um, responding to external trade policy can do. It, change, it has changed legislation. It has changed the set of play of policy making. Um, it has changed even the, um, the way that business is done, technology, technology that is uh, the way that you are able, one is able to establish a chain of custody. Everything, everything has changed. And it's interesting, since you're talking about sustainability, it's also interesting to note that uh, this, this lexicon of what constitutes legality or legal timber has even entered into um, our, our, our strategy on the sustainable goals. For instance, in Ghana's um, response on SDG 15, it says that uh, there's a life on land. A strategy is, is the strategy is one of the strategies to achieve this is to buy only certified timber and wood products from legal sources. So uh, there's an, ent an entrenchment, there's a traction of, of the impacts of this um, policy to ensure that only, only timber that can be certified as legal goes to Europe. 
So all these are positive impacts, I must say, talking about the impacts, all these are positive in, impacts and uh, the, the, the stakeholders in the country agree to it. Um, however, as mentioned by the first week, I must say that these changes are very elaborate and are also resource and time consuming. It, uh, it, it took us on the, uh, from the onset of, 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 of uh, participating or signing the agreement, it's taken us more than 10 years to see these things, you know, gain traction or to see these changes on the ground. So yes, uh, recognizing the usefulness of, 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 of the impact of some of these trade policies, uh, we also note, and I, I want to actually all the time establish that the, the time it takes and the resources required to, 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 to see through the shifts of the transformation are enormous. And it must be recognized by policymakers uh, when um, um, these policies have been enacted, that from the time of pronouncing that this is what must be seen on the market, uh, to the time of seeing it, there's a lot that takes place and, and it must not be taken lightly. And I say this because uh, moving to the challenges, uh, we've I've talked about the good side of it, but moving to the challenges, um, it, is, it is a real disincentive sometimes when in the middle of effecting these elaborate changes, uh, we, we, we see that policy is being redirected or amended. Uh, and again, continuing with the, with the example of the timber subsector, um, our focus for the last 12 years has been to ensure that we do not only ensure the, as again, entrenched in our actions on uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG uh, 15, we, we are latched on to ensuring that timber goes to the market and is legal. And so in the middle of it, when there's an amendment or addition to the policy, that seems to change the direction. Um, it, is a, it creates a huge disincentive. That's something that must be noted, that once um, countries get on the track to deliver along a certain policy line, they must be held to come to the end of the game. Otherwise, um, changing course in the middle of it is not, is not helpful. But let me, let me quickly uh, round up and say that uh, the challenges and uh, there are challenges and opportunities as far as me meeting the sustainable development goals are concerned. Uh, and as, I said, as I've stated, trade policies on the, on the demand side has a potential to shape practice on the supply side and by extension sustainability. I mean, change in policy direction can mean a lot in terms of investment, change of systems and planning for trade partners on the supply side. So redirection of efforts on the supply side could take sometimes a decade to achieve. It can upset, upset um, planning on the, supply side, on the supply side. So the opportunity cost of pursuing initiatives that do not bring intended results uh, should be recognized it can be huge, okay? So policies that tend to create trade barriers, in conclusion, policies that tend to create trade barriers reduce income opportunities and certainly militate against achievement of the SDGs. Running across is uh, employment generation, improvement, improvements in living standards, and the constraints, it constrains the capacity of forest dependent or less privileged to educate their children. Um, let, me, let me end it here. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to make these reflections. Thanks very much to you, Mr. Biko, for sharing the perspective uh, from a producer country and for addressing the challenges and opportunities that uh, the policies we are discussing represent for your country's sustainable development objectives. Um, as you are aware, we are running uh, uh, I mean, but like a behind schedule. So I will skip the short Q&A segment that I had anticipated in case some uh, participants had questions. And I would like uh, to turn uh, directly to our discussants. Um, Mr. Uh, Ohosu Adai couldn't join because he's a, a farmer based in Ghana and he had connectivity problems. Uh, that's uh, a reality that people face when they're in the field. We, we had wanted to bring the perspective from the field. Um, so um, with that, I would like to invite Mr. Daniel Lauchenauer 
to make his intervention. And I would like him to please share his views on the approaches discussed and how he sees uh, those approaches being implemented in practice and how um, we can increase the effectivity of such approaches and implementation. So Mr. Lauchenauer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for all this, this interesting presentation. It's quite overwhelming, this, this flower bouquet of initiatives, measures, reactions. So it's re it was really, really big pleasure to listen. I, I particularly noted the, the, the presentation of, of uh, Professor Bjorgi on the introduction of these PPMs, the SEPA agreement, which is something we are from the State Secretary of Economic Affairs and the Development Co Economic Development Corporation of Switzerland are really following closely. And it links to, to many of our, our initiatives and, and work we have been and are doing. So I will also come back to that. But I found it striking also that the, seeing all these positive elements which can be there, but, but struggling or finding the balance between simplicity and, and complexity and being pragmatic, being impl having implemented the solutions and uh, aiming for the perfect, which, which is really a, yeah, a big struggle which, which uh, you are in when you, when you want to, to aim for something like this, the SIP, SIP agreement. I also much appreciated the, 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 the presentation of Ms. Child on this, on the fact dialogue. I think it's, it's crucial to, to have this broad dialogue platforms and bring people together encounters together to, to agree on a, on a common roadmap. It's, it's a long way to go. Eh? It's a challenging entertaining entertainment what, do we, uh, what, you, what you are aiming at. And, and it's really the big challenge then is not to, to end up at the, at the well, talk shop, to put it negatively, but really to, to make this roadmap you are developing, to put it into reality and into life. I think this is, this is really a big challenge. I, I, I believe you are on good way, but uh, it's impressive what, what you presented. I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting initiative, which I would like to look closer into it and learn more at one moment. I, I was struck by one comment of Mr. Partiti when he said uh, that, uh, well, companies are calling now for standards to step up. And I think it's quite, quite a nice twist, which, which we see here. The traditional view of standards is the consumers well, want companies to comply with some, something and push to something to be better, to be more compliant, to have fairer products or more econo economic, uh, ecologic product. And with this, with this request from the due diligence requirements we see, which are introduced in many countries now, the EU and Switzerland, it's also now the companies say, okay, it's, it's interesting these this voluntary sustainability standards, but you have to be reliable. We have to, to trust on you. And it's kind of bringing pressure into them uh, from a different angle, which, which I, I, I didn't think about before. I think it was, it's quite nice. And as I said, these, these initiatives, they, they link to many, many activities, approaches. We are following also in the develop, Economic Development Corporation of Switzerland, implemented by the State Secretary of Economic Affairs. Since, since a long, time we are we are supporting multi-stakeholder initiatives in various forms that will bring government companies together in a dialogue aiming at finding solutions to towards more sustainable products we have been supporting with the UNDP the national palm oil platform in Indonesia we are working closely with the Swiss cocoa platform for sustainable cocoa where where we really want to bring this, this, uh, this discussion, this, this topic, um, facilitate a dialogue and uh, within Switzerland, but also in the producing countries, in particular Ghana is of course for Switzerland and the COA platform, a very important partner. So, so it's, uh, that's one area we have worked. And what we are also scaling up increasingly is the, the landscape approach, which has been measured, mentioned several times. Also in the context of the, of the SEPA agreement, uh, we believe that in Indonesia, but also in other countries, uh, this approach can really bring in, bring, bring interesting added value. This bringing in a regional area, the different countries together and uh, the different players together to, to agree on, uh, 
on targets, on uh, on uh, development plan of their region, and and work towards that. We are planning to set up a new program uh, in Indonesia in due time. And lastly, and I will end with that, uh, the voluntary sustainability standard. Where in the past we started with rather specific individual support to select the standards, which we moved over the last 10 years to more holistic approaches where we work with the International Trade Center and the sustainability platform where you can compare different standards, see who looks at what, or the, the, our cooperation with ISEAL, which is kind of an umbrella organization. And I think this higher level uh, engagement will, will really yeah, bring the sector forward and also help to address the request from the companies to the VSS to stand up and, and perform. Thank you. Many thanks to you, Mr. Lachenauer. Uh, before inviting Ms. Rufstuhl to take the floor, I would like to, to mention that uh, we will extend uh, this event uh, by five more minutes. So we will have time for Ms. Rufstuhl to make her presentation. So we will end at 4.20 Geneva time, uh, 3.30. 20 UK time. Um, and we, we have to skip the Q&A session, uh, but please uh, send your questions and we will get back to you with answers. And I think this is like an excellent starting point for uh, a conversation in, in, the, in the new year. So having said that, I am very pleased to now introduce uh, Ms. Sandra Ruchstuhl, who will share a private sector perspective. Uh, Ms. Ruchstuhl, um, we would like to ask you how are value chains and business processes adapted as a result of new measures in consumer countries and whether this enables or disables sustainable performance uh, of a business enterprise. Uh, Ms. Hochschul, thanks for joining. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon to you all. Um, great to be with you today. I will try to keep it short uh, so that um, we are not too much behind schedule. So the presentation of all of you showed that there is a lot of important international developments with new approaches going on and that only cooperation and a smart mix of measures will allow us to tackle deforestation. Nestle supports such developments like um, the ones, uh, the EFTA um, uh, Indonesia Free Trade Agreement that was mentioned by Ms. And Mr. Lauchenauer and Mrs. Burki. Um, Neste Switzerland supported SECO as a founding member of the multi-stakeholder platform Palm Oil Network Switzerland in the negotiations. And we welcome that EFTA has succeeded in securing clear provision to ensure sustainable and traceable uh, traceability on palm oil. This is in line with Neste's global sustainability ambition and that kind of FTA might be uh, a model for the future if we think about the ongoing negotiations with um, Malaysia. The other um, platform that you, Mr. Lankenacher, just mentioned, uh, we are also part of the Swiss platform for sustainable cocoa, which is, of course, also a, a really great tool. Now, what is Nestle's commitments and how do we take action towards deforestation free supply chain in our key agricultural commodities? This uh, year, Nestle announced that it will move beyond protecting forests to restoring them as part of its efforts to reach net zero emissions by 2050. With its new forest positive approach, the company will also further promote sustainable livelihoods and the respect of human rights. Now, for example, Nestle will reward suppliers for their environmental efforts by buying bigger quantities, contracting with them long term, co-investing in programs that promote forest conservation and restoration, or by paying uh, a premium for their products. This action built up in a decade of work to end deforestation in Nestle's key forest commodities, which are um, 90 percent um, of these key ingredients, palm oil, sugar, soy, meat, as well as pulp and paper, who have been assessed as deforestation free as of December 2020. Nestle has used tools such as supply chain mapping, certification, on-site verification, and more and more satellite monitoring services like Starling or Global Forest Watch to achieve these results. In addition, the company also collaborated with farmers, uh, especially also uh, smallholder farmers, farming communities and suppliers on the ground. 
Nestle will also accelerate its work to eliminate deforestation in its palm oil, sugar, soy, meat, as well as pulp and paper supply chains by 2020. And by 2050, we plan to achieve the same for co coffee and cocoa supply chains, which is still a big challenge as we are committed to keep the smallholder in this journey. Forest positive is only achievable if we work hand in hand with farmers, local communities, industry partners, and governments to form wider solution across local, regional, and global levels. We have reported regularly and publicly on our progress, disclosed our list of suppliers, and published, for example, in the palm area, the palm oil transparency dashboard to share our learnings and data. We recognize that even as a large company, we are still very small before such an enormous challenge. There is work to do within our supply chain, but well beyond it too. That takes an unprecedented alignment of vision and action among stakeholders worldwide, and we are pleased to be part of that dialogue and today's session. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to you, Ms. Rustur, for sharing this uh, update on the actions taken by the company you represent. Well, uh, we are getting to the, <laughs> to the hour uh, that was uh, indicated to conclude this panel. Um, I would like to uh, thank all panelists for their very insightful interventions and to all attendees for their interest and participation in this session. I would also like to thank in particular Dr. Elizabeth Virgi Bonanomi and Ms. Marilisa Madel, as well as Ms. my colleagues Cristina Larrea and Andreas Oeschger for all the work we have done together to prepare this session. It has been an impressive team effort on behalf of many. Thank you again, and I wish you a great day and a great weekend. Thanks very much. Goodbye.